Our enthusiastic protagonist, Toru Aibon, is part of a highly ranked team of warriors who are led by his best friend and renowned fighter, Sane. Friends from a very young age, the group share a bond together, helping each other on and off the battlefield. It felt like nothing could ever ruin this fraternity. That is, until the other members in the team sat him down and announced that he is being exiled. Holding his head in his hands, Sane feigns concern by saying that Toru's strength is relatively weak in comparison to the rest of the group and it would be tragic if he dies while fighting. As expected, our protagonist is shell-shocked and can only look around with his mouth agape. He locks eyes with his fiancée, Lisa, but she does not offer any sympathy and simply agrees with the team leader. Toru catches sight of her hand, where she is wearing a ring different from that that he had gifted her on their engagement. Looking at the other female members of the group and then at Sane, he puts two and two together. The hero was sleeping with all of them, including his fiancée. This feels like a punch in the gut for our protagonist, and he charges at the person responsible for all this. He uppercuts Sane right across the jaw and blames him for everything. The other members rush to Sane's rescue and banish Toru out of the party forever. He then walks out of the pub, a broken man. Drenched in the rain, Toru cannot help but stare at the engagement ring in his hand that he had given to the love of his life. He is unable to break free of her picture in his mind and of the negative thoughts that accompany it. He falls to the ground and lets out a bellow of defeat. Eventually, the rain clears and our protagonist has no choice but to plan for the future. He brings up his combat stats and compares them to his ex-friends. While they were unremarkably strong at higher levels, he had been stuck at 20 for quite some time. This does nothing to improve his mood, and to let out some anger, he manages to slay a black demon dog. As if on cue, suddenly his stats receive an enormous boost, and he powers up to an extreme level 300. Turns out that his mystery skill was saving experience, and once he reached the required level, all of his abilities maximized. Considering that Sane is only a mere level 60, Toru cannot help but be proud of his improvement. Looking up at the sky with a satisfied smile, our protagonist finally sees things beginning to work out for him. Wanderlust has taken over Toru, and he decides to travel to the neighboring country of Amund. The first thing he notices as he enters Amund is a slave store. Thinking of his loneliness and his friend's betrayal, Toru wishes to have an acquaintance by his side who would never leave him. He is greeted by an oily salesman as he enters the shop, who begins by showing him the most expensive type of servants. These range from a lizard man to a combat elf. However, our protagonist is in search of something cheaper, which is when the salesman takes him to the back, where the uglier and powerless slaves are caged. A small girl catches our protagonist's eye. When inquiring about her, he finds that she has certain beast-like qualities such as a budding tail, but her features are humanoid. Her low price is because she is ill with a rare disease, but this does not stop Taru from purchasing her. He leaves the shop with the girl, whose name is revealed to be Katie. He then proceeds to take her to a doctor, where he discloses that the disease is unusual and can only be cured by a potion made from the heart of a pure dragon. With eyes filled with compassion, Toru promises Katie that he would do everything in his power to help her recover. Our protagonist begins his quest for the dragon by searching deep into the woods. All the other mythical creatures there steer clear of him when they sense his high ranking. He finally catches sight of a black dragon. This would be the first time he has the chance to test the limit of his abilities. Normally, an entire army would be used to slay the beast, but it only takes Toru one blow of his sword to slice the creature's head clean off. The heart finally in his possession, he then returns back home and prepares the potion for Katie, which she first stares at with surprise. It is a shock that someone would go to such lengths to help her out. Swiftly finishing the drink, she then falls asleep. Toru wakes up the next day with Katie still passed out next to him. He decides to dine on dragon meat for breakfast and requests a puzzled chef to prepare the dish for him. It turns out that despite their danger, dragons are actually quite delicious, and he takes up a burger for his servant too. It is obvious that the poor girl is starving as she finishes the dragon burger in a matter of minutes. Noticing the rags that Katie is wearing, Toru takes her out shopping. He purchases clothes of the latest trend and fashion, such as a crop top and miniskirt. Katie is almost unrecognizable from the malnutrition sick slave girl that had been caged in the store. Overjoyed at her change in fortunes, she is unable to keep a smile off of her face. She requests Taru to purchase two iron fans as weapons for her. Although he is hesitant initially as he feels that she will be unable to wield the huge fans, he purchases them for her when she shows that they are weightless for her due to her beast-like strength. Once the shopping is done, the two sit at a park bench and share snacks together. She refers to him as Master, which makes him uncomfortable and he asks her to call him something else. This immediately triggers her abandonment issues as she feels like he is about to get rid of her. He then comforts her, saying that he wishes that she would remain by his side until the end of his life. Katie is overjoyed when she hears this and exclaims with enthusiasm. Toru then comments about Katie's hair when he suddenly feels a surge of power. Staring at his hands, he does not understand where this pressure is coming from. Magical energy begins to course through his veins, and even our protagonist is taken aback at how intense it feels. Katie, who can only see her master's body shaking, is frightened. Opening up his power stats, Toru is even more shocked to see that the limit on his skills has been broken, and a new limit is now set, which means that he has gained a large amount of experience. 
Such was the strength of his power boost that Katie can feel his aura, and she falls off the bench they are sitting on. Slowly, Toru manages his aura and takes back control. Apologizing to the little girl for scaring her and helping her back up, he then explains how his stats got boosted up, which makes her gush in happiness about how strong her master is. Reviewing his stats, he is puzzled as to how he had managed to keep level 50 when the normal level is 10. Not wanting to worry Katie any further, he puts it away and focuses on his acquaintance once again. He asks if she requires anything, and just as she is about to say something, she changes her mind and replies in the negative. He coaxes her into telling him what she needs, and eventually she reveals that a bar of soap is all she requires, which seems to be a strange request. However, Toru fulfills it, and the duo returns home. It seems that Katie has never taken a proper bath, as Toru suggests that they take one together. As expected, she is a bit embarrassed by such an intimate act, but her master convinces her that nothing inappropriate would take place. Sitting on a bucket, draped by only a towel, Katie first gets her hair cleaned by Toru. As he runs the soap through her hair, he notices the budding tail growing from her lower back, and asks her what type of breed of animal she is. She reveals that she is a fox, which amuses Toru as he has heard that fox types have golden fur. As he continues to spread the soap over her body, he accidentally touches her bare chest, which shocks them both. Taking a step back, our protagonist does not know how to react, but the loyal slave Katie says that she is at her master's disposal no matter what he has in mind. Uncomfortable, due to the young age of the girl, he lightly taps her across the head and says with bemusement that he would consider it when she's older. Now that she's all clean, Katie decides to take her master's wishes into account and give herself a haircut. Strands of her hair fall to the floor as she cuts strand after strand in an amateurish fashion. Toro, who is watching the spectacle, comments to himself that he was not aware that she is quite so attractive. He points out two protruding areas on her head, which he thinks she forgot to cut. Katie reveals that those are her animal ears, which surprises our protagonist as she already has human ears as well. The god which had created them seems to have had an ear fetish. A single pair of ears were not enough for them. As the day descends into dusk, the two clean up the house together. Despite having a slave, Toru takes great care of her and lends a hand in all the chores. Unable to contain her happiness, Katie informs her master that she had a great time that day, and she hopes that they could create many more unforgettable memories together. The next day, Tara returns to the house looking extremely tired and vexed. Noticing her master's exhaustion, Katie inquires about it, to which her protagonist reveals that the elderly salesman at the store had gotten pissed at him and charged extra for the repair of his swords. Meeting the girl's questioning stare, Toru then explains how he had been cleaning his sword a few days ago and had accidentally broken it. In need of a new weapon, he then goes to an armory where the salesman presents the sturdiest sword. However, a single swipe of the blade not only shatters the metal, but also the windows of the building. When the dust clears, the salesman is left speechless when he notices every single one of his weapons off their racks and into the walls. Paying off the damages created a huge financial loss for our protagonist. Not wanting her master to be worried, Katie comes to the rescue and explains that she has the perfect weapon for a fearsome warrior such as Toru to wield. However, it is Toru's turn to be astounded when she leads him to the Temple of Sacred Arms. The structure contains some of the most sacred weapons that are only meant to be used by heroes. However, Toru is a bit doubtful if he is worthy and if he will be able to pull out the sword. However, Katie has a blind trust in his ability and encourages her master. Entering the building, the first thing Toru exclaims about is how spacious it seems. Katie explains that it was rumored to have been built by the gods. Moreover, she explains the test he would have to go through if he wishes to possess the legendary weapon. The first would be to open the locked door at the temple, and the second is to remove the sword from its pedestal. Sounds easy, right? That is, until Toru catches sight of the enormous door. Despite its design, the door looks like it could only be pushed open by a very strong giant, particularly since it does not have a handle. However, this is where Toru's ungraded skills come in handy, and simply a touch on the door manages to unlock it. No one is as overjoyed as Katie, who loudly exclaims. The two then walk in, where the sacred sword is hidden in plain sight. It seems as if it's molded into the pedestal, and even our protagonist, with all his strength, faces difficulty in pulling it out. However, after multiple tugs, he manages to finally wield it in his grip. Katie reveals that the sacred arms adapt themselves according to the user, so even if it seems like it's one-handed, the weapon would soon adjust itself according to Taru. Our protagonist then remembers that this would all not have been possible without Katie's advice and help, and he appreciates her. However, she is humble as always and just calls her master the chosen one. Hearing such compliments fills Taru with pride since he had never been praised in such a way with his old group. Exiting the building, Taru reveals that once they reach the city, the two would form a group and go on adventures together. A satisfied smile plays on the lips of the girl, who is just content to be by her master's side. Back at Toru's old home, Sane is busy being intimate with the other female members of the team. It seems as if they've been at it for hours, as the girls seem out of breath, while even Sane has sat down to take a breather. Thinking about Taru, Sane cannot hide the amused smile on his face. 
he seems to be quite pleased about betraying his best friend, not only by exiling him from the group, but by also stealing his fiance. Although our poor protagonist was not aware, Lisa and Sane were sleeping together for quite some time. As he walks towards the other two females, Nay and Sora, he uses his secret skill, the demonic eye of Lure, to hypnotize and turn them into his sex slaves once again. This was how he had managed to turn all of them against Taru. Such was the intensity of this skill that one look from Sane was enough for Lisa to forget all her love for Taru and to cheat on him. Sane had always been jealous of his counterpart. Taru had that natural charm that attracted the opposite gender naturally, and this filled his supposed best friend with contempt. So, as soon as he unlocked the Eye of Lure, his fiancé was the first person he seduced, and soon enough he had enough control over the party that he was able to convince them to abandon the poor warrior. Enjoying the sensual attention of the two girls, Sane is satisfied that he does not have to bear the burden of any low-level team members anymore, and so he could focus on defeating the Demon Lord. The Demon Lord is a creature that appears along with a disaster every hundred years, and he either belongs to the demonic or human tribe. Turning his mind to Lisa, who is still deep in his spell, he cannot help but imagine the fame and riches he would receive once he defeated the sacred being, and how the world would bow to his feet. With a bellow of victory, he rejoices over how he is living his best life. The cocky warrior is in for a reality check when he receives the news that the legendary dragon he was meant to kill had already been slain. Saint is unable to mask his shock as he asks the old man who it was that had murdered such a mighty beast. However, he wasn't able to provide any further information, only revealing that they had found the decapitated body of the creature in the forest. With a grunt of anger, Saint punches the trunk of a nearby tree. Lisa, Nay, and Sora, who are accompanying him and under his spell, try to comfort him. Feigning a smile, he then turns his attention to the sacred Temple of Arms. However, he receives yet another shock when he finds the building empty. At this point, he is unable to control his rage, and when Lisa attempts to touch him, he smacks her away and threatens to kill her if she touches him again. But now, Sane has begun to wonder if Toru has something to do with this, since everything had begun to mess up since he was exiled. However, the idea that such a low-leveled warrior could defeat a red dragon and steal a sacred weapon is impossible, which is why he then decides to change his plan. One way he could make himself get recognized among the public is by completing the dungeon of Luntada. When he asks a local for directions, he simply points the group forward where a huge hole is waiting for them. Falling down to his knees, Sane is unable to understand how some warrior had beaten him to this mission. Going back a month, Toru and Katie were present in the town of Luntada to receive their adventurer cards. Katie is at a junior level D, while Toru has gone down from an S rank to a B. While wandering the town, Katie comments about the overpowering smell of alcohol, which our protagonist reveals is normal, since this place is known for its entertainment and festivities. The poor innocent soul of the girl cannot imagine what her master would wish to do in such a place and attempts to distract him by informing him about a dungeon that is present in the city. However, Toru is already aware of this, and says that they would explore it the next day. He then explains to her the function of dungeons for adventurers. Many adventurers make a living out of defeating the monsters present in them, and selling the treasure and materials they uncover. More determined adventurers attempt to reach the bottom of the dungeon where the core stone is present. This is a valuable and rare form of material, which allows the finder to also receive multiple skills and other rewards. The next day, Toru and Katie explore the first floor of the dungeon. The former is impressed that the little girl is quite capable with her magic, and manages to defeat many wild creatures present here. His experience multiplier also allows her to level up really swiftly. Such is her determination to become as strong as her master that she slays monster after monster single-handedly until they reach the third floor. Despite reaching level 30, Katie is still not ready to give up, even though the two have collected a large amount of treasure. However, Toru requests her to slow down and that overworking herself would do more harm than benefits. They then take a magical object that would act as a storage bag and return to the surface. Katie has managed to collect a large number of coins as she orders a huge feast to enjoy along with her master. He is a bit hesitant in sharing what her hard work had earned, but Katie's moody pout is enough for him to start filling up his plate too. After a satisfying day and filled stomachs, the two make their way back home. While walking, Toru cannot help but thank his lucky stars for his little acquaintance, who had made him feel like life is worth living again. The next morning, Toru is suddenly awakened by Katie nudging him. With blurry vision, he is able to decipher the girl sitting next to him covering herself with a sheet. As his eyes clear up, he is taken aback to see how much she has changed. In a single night, her ears had grown out and her body had become even more feminine. Katie has grown bunny ears, but it's not the only thing she has grown. She has turned into a full-fledged woman. A drop of sweat runs down Toru's cheeks as he questions her if she is really Katie. A trillion question marks float over his head as he asks himself how in this world could this happen. With his eyes glued to Katie, he waits for her to respond. Katie looks embarrassed while struggling to cover her new huge body with a piece of cloth. He thinks this change could be due to the sudden increase in her level. Toru sits with his legs crossed and keenly listens to her. However, it doesn't seem to make sense to him. She further explains that she had once heard that when a child rises above level 20, their body rapidly grows overnight to balance out their increased power. Toru's brain starts putting two and two together. 
He admits that involuntarily, balancing body and power is not impossible as his race changed when he suddenly leveled up. It suddenly starts making sense to him, but there's only one problem left. He could have never imagined that leveling up would cause her to become such a beauty overnight. While staring at Katie, who is standing innocently and is waiting for Tara to complete his train of thought, he admits to himself that he can no longer treat her like a little kid. Eventually, Tara gives up and asks Katie why she's naked. He's already in an intense dilemma and asks her to put some clothes on. Her bunny ears drop as she picks up her old clothes. They have been torn apart and she has nothing else to wear. Frustrated and impatient, Toru asks her to put on his clothes for the moment. Katie gets excited at that mention that those belong to him. She instantly starts sniffing them while claiming that they really do smell like him. Fighting his intrusive thoughts, Toru turns around and gives her the privacy to change. He assumes that his shirt would be too big for her, so it should be enough. However, when he takes a peek, he realizes that she definitely needs a pair of pants too. He quickly covers his eyes and hands them over to her. Later that day, the duo goes out shopping, and Katie eventually manages to find a perfect outfit for herself. She asks her master for his opinion, and Toru comments that it suits her very well. Seeing her blush at such an insignificant compliment, Toru thinks to himself that although her body has grown, she is still a little kid on the inside. He asks her if she can handle the iron fan properly, and she starts shaking it in every direction to prove that it's not a problem for her. Toru comments that this item will allow her to perform two magical attacks at once. After enjoying some goofy moments together, the duo heads out of town. The citizens can't help but stop and stare with amazement at them. Everyone starts whispering and asking each other since there was such a gorgeous woman in the city. Some wish to have a slave like her, while others just stare and compliment her beauty. The duo awkwardly make their way through the town. Toru finds the sudden gush of compliments over Katie's beauty and the jealousy aimed at him from the men to be very annoying. He shrugs his frustration away when Katie excitedly tells him that today she will earn a lot of money for him. Toru reminds her that she doesn't have to worry about it as he still has some money left over from when he killed the dragon. For today, he just wants to focus on leveling Katie up and he has come prepared for that by bringing bags of food and water. Katie gets excited like a kid and starts wagging her tail while yelling that today they will have fun, reminding Toru again that she is still the same on the inside. The first quest involves dealing with a squad of armed skeletons. She uses aerial blasts to effortlessly blow them all away. Next, she uses her iron fans to fire at the enemy which results in her victory. Toru applauds and looks proud of her. However, he's gotten a bit bored and is getting sleepy because Katie's current level is 50 and the level needed for the fourth floor is only 15. Katie notices that Toru has gotten tired, so she asks him. Toru tells her that he woke up early this morning, so he's a bit sleepy. Katie suddenly gets an idea, and at the speed of light, she cleans up the entire place with the help of her iron fans. She then lays down a carpet and asks Toru to take a little rest on her lap. As expected, Toru happily obliges and remarks that she smells good. He wakes up after a while and is surprised to see a bunch of new skeleton bones lying around. Apparently, they attacked when Toru was asleep, but Katie defeated them. Toru is shocked after realizing that she did that without even flinching as he was sleeping on her lap. After that, Kitty dusts him off with her tail, and Toru starts feeling like he is in a sage mode. Suddenly, he realizes that he knows nothing about her current stats, so he asks her. However, he thinks that she might not want to reveal it. Contrary to his thoughts, Katie is happy to do whatever he asks of her. He looks at her skill levels and other information. Her level is 50, her race is a white fox, age is 15. He also notices some skills that he believes a mage would have. For example, the skill of healing wave, chant omission, power boost, and attack correction. Toru comments that the power boost is a rare ability that only famous mages possess. A sudden realization hits him that this girl in front of him is soon going to be a big star. He had only asked her to show her stats to clear his doubts. Now that he's sure of her abilities, he asks her if she wants to go even lower floors, and so they arrive at the 10th floor. Soon, Toru finds out that the way Katie's magic works is remarkable. Her magic strength increases faster than the amount she uses. Enemy after enemy, she takes care of all of them without asking Toru for any help. He remarks that goblin riders are supposed to be strong opponents. Initially, he was worried for Katie, but in the end, he only feels sorry for the goblins. Eventually, they arrive at the 20th floor and Katie unlocks level 150. The duo stop to replenish their energy with food. Tora asks her if there are any tricks to use magic. She responds that imagining the image is the most important thing. So, he closes his palm, imagines a flame, and when he opens his hand, it magically appears. On the 90th floor, opponents that even Taro has never fought appear. He warns Katie to be cautious, but later realizes that he has no reason to be worried. She is level 200 by now, and uses a freezing ability to eliminate all the opponents without breaking a sweat. On the 13th floor, the duo is unable to sense the presence of any enemy. Suddenly, a core appears, and Katie gets excited as it shows that they must have reached the end. At Katie's request, he touches it, and it marks the end of the first dungeon. Apparently, after touching the core, Toru passes out. He wakes up to the sound of Katie yelling his name. She informs him that the dungeon they were in has disappeared. They seem to be at the bottom of some trench and can see a starry sky above. He notices that a ring has appeared mysteriously on his and Katie's fingers. 
they assume that it must be the reward for quickly clearing a dungeon. Suddenly, three screens appear informing them that they have acquired Rings of Disguise that allow them to hide their status, disguise as someone else, or disguise their status as someone else's. The second fast clear reward is that a dungeon will be granted to the duo. After claiming the rewards, Toru picks Katie up and jumps out of the trench they were in. Two days pass by and they seem to be headed towards a city named Aeneric, with the aim to explore the Runes of the Gods. Toru admits that the trip is pretty much pointless, but there are certain things they wish to do here. Apparently, the reason for the destruction and disappearance of the civilization is still unknown, but it seems that once upon a time, there was an advanced civilization that once lived here, and the creators of the civilization are called the Great Racers. Toru seems to be obsessed with ruins and their exploration, therefore he is excited for this long trip. It seems that there are still some buildings left from the era of the Great Racer. On their journey, Katie asks him if he has decided on a name for their party. Toru thinks for a while and eventually settles on the Roaming Brigade. Now that they have some free time on their hands, Toru asks her how she became a slave. Before she can answer, a carriage in front of them gets attacked by a bunch of bandits. The duo immediately steps in to help them. When Toru blows them away by simply breathing out and Katie stops an arrow with her bare hands, the bandits realize that they are doomed. It turns out that the one riding the carriage was a woman named Marinata, and she is the daughter of Count Rota. Toru blushes after seeing her, causing Katie to panic. After Toru introduces himself, she holds his hand and requests him to come to the mansion so she can offer her gratitude. Apparently, she's from Eneric, the place where the duo was originally headed to. They arrive at the mansion, and Marianta's personal servant, Urara, takes them to their rooms. Seeing such a comfy bed, Toru immediately jumps on it like a five-year-old. Much to his embarrassment, Marianta is still standing at the doorway. She chuckles and invites him to join her on a trip whenever he feels like it. The next day, Marianta takes them out and shows them around the city. Toru is surprised that Marianta is allowed to roam freely when the enemy could attack any time. Even though Urara is there to protect her, he is surprised that she can be so confident about her powers. That's when Urara reveals that she's an S-ranked adventurer. Meanwhile, Marianta and Katie have gotten super close. Marianta takes Katie to a sweet shop and Toru hands her some allowance. While everyone is having fun, Toru reminds himself that he is willing to free Katie if she wishes. Apparently, he has been saving up for her. He just hopes to fill the hole in his heart that was left there by Lisa. He admits that he still feels immense pain whenever he thinks about her. He believes that if he can forget about everything that happened, he might be able to live a peaceful life and won't need a slave. Later on, they come across a huge statue, and Marianta reveals that this was made when her father, the lord of the city, was young. It was made by her and the townspeople, so she's really proud of it. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking, and Toru wonders if it's an earthquake. The statue crumbles into pieces, and some sort of tentacle-like vines appear from the ground. The tentacles grab Marianta and the other citizens and lift them up into the air, catching Toru off guard and unprepared. It appears that the tentacles have selectively chosen their victims. After swinging the subjects into the air for a while, it abruptly disappears back into the ground. All that's left are crumbled pieces of the statue and a giant hole that looks infinitely deep right where the statue used to be. Arara, Toru, and Katie stare at the giant trench and assess their situation. They are surrounded by civilians who are crying out for their grandfather, mother, daughters, etc. Toru grits his teeth when he realizes that many civilians have been kidnapped alongside Marianta. However, he has no time to analyze the situation. Urara has vowed her life to protect Marianta. Seeing her master disappear into the hands of the enemy causes her to panic, and she decides to jump into the hole. Toru decides not to stop, but instead calls out Katie's name. The latter doesn't need words to understand what Toru wants. She understands that Toru wants her to follow him down the hole. The duo starts chasing after Urara, and Toru asks her to take him with her. Even though she loves her master, she still can't disregard her duties as a loyal maid. Therefore, she says that it's not fitting for their guests to jump into danger for them. However, Toru knows that she is only putting up a fake front, and deep down she wants them to help her. He reminds her that in order to look for someone, you need as many people as possible. And besides, they're not just any other civilians, but individuals that hold great power. The help is bound to be useful. When Toru and Katie offer their help with an unrelenting smiling face, Urara gratefully accepts it and it gets somewhat relaxed. Toru grips his sword tightly, and the trio jumps into the abyss of mystery. The trench turns out to be deeper than they had assumed. To prevent them from facing serious injuries, Katie quickly chants some spells and makes an air cushion. The trio lands safely at the bottom. Considering the depth of this hidden underground world, there is utter darkness. However, as long as they have the pro mage Katie with them, there is nothing to worry about. Without wasting any time, she makes a light ball with her iron fan. The ball floats in the air and follows them wherever they go. They are finally able to analyze their surroundings. There are rubbles in every direction, and it seems that in front of them is a massive gate that can only be built for giants. On both sides of the doorway, there seems to be two guards wearing armor and carrying a shield. However, these guards are not of human size. The trio looks like ants in front of them. A drop of sweat runs down Toru's forehead as he tries to understand this hell that they have voluntarily jumped into. 
Urara explains that this place is called the Underground Ruins. The city of Einrich was actually built on top of a huge archaeological site, and right now they are basically stuck in a maze. Katie calls Toru to show him something bizarre that she just discovered. It appears that the entire place is covered in strange mucus. Urara questions if the mysterious substance belongs to the creature that kidnaps Marianta and the others. However, the mucus only seems to be scattered in a certain pattern. Urara suggests that maybe if they follow the mucus, they might be able to catch the monster. Toru takes the lead and decides on a formation. He suggests that he will be going in the front to fight head-on any enemy that attacks from there. Urara is given the position to be at the rear, and Katie is ordered to be vigilant in the middle. Everyone puts their guard up, and Urara grabs her kunai, whereas Katie pulls out her iron fan. The trio heads out and looks determined to complete their mission successfully. The walls of the maze seem to be covered in the same type of vines that erupted from the ground. Suddenly, the trio is attacked by ogres that seem to be carrying weapons of their own. As they had expected, these mini-goblins are no match for the three of them. Eventually, they decide to split and meet at a certain point. It seems that the maze is never-ending. Toru seems to be fed up as he asks the other two how much deeper the place is. Urara comments that she has gone in multiple times, but has only made it to four levels. She adds that she didn't go any deeper than that, as she doesn't know what is going to be lurking in the shadows. Toru has got the hang of Katie's powers, so he asks her if she has caught Marianta's scent yet. Katie responds that her scent seems to be coming from the same direction as the slimy mucus. While listening to Katie, Toru's defense starts lacking, and a monstrous dog almost attacks him from behind. Although Urara is a bit far away, she still manages to save him and kills the creature with one shot. Impressed by her high level and good skills, Toru asks Urara what job she normally does. With a plain expression and an emotionless face, Urara casually replies that she is an assassin. Toru is shocked at this sudden revelation, and realizes that she would have taken care of the bandits even if they did not step in to save Marianta's cage. Suddenly, Katie shouts that Marianta's scent is getting closer, which means that they have almost reached their destination. They step on the bridge that has been decorated with fire. It leads to yet another gigantic gate with a cryptic sculpture at the top. The entrance is protected by yet another army of goblins, but this one seems to be more skilled and ruthless. The commander of the army remarks that he has never expected the trio to make it this far. Their moral compass seems to be broken too, because as soon as they catch a glimpse of Urara and Katie, they excitedly start making plans to enjoy them while licking their swords. Both sides start stretching their muscles before the battle begins. Toru comments that since two horns are emerging from their heads, the enemy must be demons. Katie steps forward and claims that she'll make a path for her master Toru. The demons laugh while calling humans stupid. They rush at the trio, but suddenly get split. They look around and realize that they have been surrounded by walls of ice, thanks to Katie's iron fan. Toru smirks and embraces himself to attack the enemy. However, Urara and Katie request him to leave the goblins to them and instead go save Marianta. He entrusts the job of fighting to them and rushes to the gate. He slips past the demons that were blocking his way and then takes down the gigantic gate with one punch. Sitting on the throne is a one-horned bearded man, who seems to be controlling a giant slug that possesses tentacles. The man comments that the food for his pet has finally arrived. The slug succeeds in capturing Toru while he was busy talking with the weird man. When asking why he attacked the city, the man replies that the Einrich is connected with another city through his underground place. He plans to defeat the country, because of which he needs to take down the lords. To keep the county in check, he has kidnapped Marianta. Frustrated by his audacity, Toru tears apart the tentacles that were holding him back. The man warns him not to step over the fire, and Toru accepts it as a challenge. As soon as he starts walking close to the enemy, he gets splashed by millions of grenade explosions. The damage is huge, and the man remarks that there is no way anyone could ever possibly survive that blast. However, the view before him sends shivers down his spine. His eyes are left wide open when he sees Toru standing in front of him, unscathed. He asks the enemy if the explosion has satisfied him, because it is impossible for him to get hurt by such a puny attack. The man starts calling him a monster and sends another grenade splash on Toru's way. Unbothered and uninjured, Toru calmly walks towards his enemy. Again, the explosions couldn't leave a single scar on him. He slashes the enemy and his giant slug. Before dying, the man asks him if he is the hero of the prophecy, and Toru responds that he is just a normal warrior. Now that Toru has destroyed the giant slug with tentacles, Marianne has been set free. She slowly regains her consciousness as Urara worriedly holds her in her arms. She requests Marianne not to go overexert herself. It appears that initially, Marianne has no clue as to what happened after the city was attacked. She slowly analyzes her surroundings and sees the giant hole in the ground. Suddenly, she starts panicking after remembering her abduction. However, she calms down after realizing that she is surrounded by other citizens who were kidnapped as well. Soon, Marianne finds Toru and Katie, who were standing calmly with smiles on their faces. They are genuinely happy to see that Marianne is doing okay. Toru starts explaining the entire situation to help clear her doubts. He informs her that a monster attacked from the underground ruins, but the only damage the city suffered is a giant hole in the ground. Marianne is relieved to hear that there were no deaths and only some citizens suffered minor injuries. 
Curiously, Marianne asks the trio who it was that saved the town. She assumes that it must have been her father. That's when Urara corrects her that Toru and Katie came to her rescue by putting their own lives in the line. When Urara bows down to thank Toru for saving her master, he shrugs it off by saying that he just didn't want her to get hurt. Soon, the citizens begin to gather around after hearing the names of the heroes who saved them and the Lord's Daughter. They too get on their knees to thank Toru and Katie. Seeing such a wholesome reaction, the duo gets flustered. As if this wasn't enough to get Toru's heart racing, Marianne suddenly jumps in to hug him tightly and thank him for protecting the people of the city. Katie's mood changes and she reminds Marianne that she is a little too close to Toru while the latter enjoys his reward. Following that, they return to the castle where Marianne reunites with her father in an emotional scene and Toru and Katie watch them from afar. Katie compliments Toru for overpowering one of the Demon King's top generals. He asks her how she knows of the general's position. Apparently, during the fight, the general revealed that he was one of the top six generals of the Demon King. Although he was the weakest of the six, his strength was not a joke. A thunderous roar comes from Taru's empty stomach, which causes the Lord and Marianne to bring their attention to him. He walks towards him and thanks him for saving his daughter, not once, but twice. It seems like Taru is not used to getting complimented, so he gets flustered again and says that it was just a coincidence. Marianne asks her father to reward Taru for his bravery, and he responds that he will do everything in his power to show gratitude to this hero. That's when Urara informs him that not only did Taru save the Lord's daughter, but he also defeated one of the king's top generals. Lord's expression suddenly change as he plans to reward Toru with something big. He asks him if he is planning to go to the capital and tells him that he will be sending a certain letter right away. Without disclosing the matter any further, he tells Toru that he and Katie can stay as long as they like, and Marianne will keep them company. The duo is treated to a delicious dinner until their appetite is satisfied. Toru asks Marianne if they could get permission to explore the underground ruins. Marianne gets concerned as to why he wants to go to the terrifying place again. Toru explains that as an adventurer, he has an interest in the place as it is practically an unexplored dungeon. Unable to contain his emotions, Toru reveals his undying passion for underground ruins that are left by some mysterious ancient race. However, they all raise objections to his idea. Katie is afraid of him getting hurt, and Urara knows that if Toru goes down there, Marianne will follow him. Marianne requests the duo to take her and Urara with them and promises not to be a burden. Toru knows that since the underground ruins are under the Lord's control, he can't just go in there. They allow Marianne to accompany them, but under the condition that Urara and Katie escort her, and Toru will take the lead and remove any obstacles in their path. If they sense any danger, they plan to retreat immediately. The next day, Toru and Katie wait for the duo to show up. Urara arrives dressed in an assassin's outfit, whereas Marianne is wearing armor that covers her from head to toe. Apparently, she told her father about their plans, and he commanded her to wear the armor. However, Toru asks her to take it off, because it will be difficult for her to move in a critical situation. Marianne quickly changes into a cuter outfit, much to Toru's delight. Apparently, the dungeon's first and second floors have already been explored, so they head beyond the second one, keeping in mind that there are a lot of dangerous areas. Marianne informs them that the next floor is flooded with demons. This makes Toru excited, so he decides to explore the dangerous areas. However, he informs them that Marianne's safety is most important, so only he will enter the dangerous areas. Suddenly, Katie catches the scent of some demons up ahead and uses her appraisal to identify the source. Apparently, it seems to be a huge mushroom-type monster. They notice a rat that accidentally walks over one of the vines, and suddenly, the mushrooms start emerging from his body. Using her appraisal skills, Katie identifies that the vines contain a powerful poison. Toru tells the ladies to wait at the back as he plans to go to the bottom himself. Katie insists on accompanying him, but Toru reminds her that he will be fine since he is level 300 and has an antidote as well. He bids them farewell and enters the room filled with mushrooms. Apparently, despite touching the vines, Toru does not get affected by the poison. After taking care of many mushroom-type monsters, Toru proceeds further into the room. He comes across some books covered in spiderwebs and treasure boxes full of potions and elixirs. He takes one of the elixirs and a mysterious key. After that, they come across another area that doesn't seem to have been well inspected. It appears to be an underground fortress. Before going any further, Marianne requests Toru to teach her how to fight so she doesn't have to always be protected by Urara. She begs him by saying that she is tired of being weak. Katie agrees to the idea, and Marianne eventually convinces Urara as well. Meanwhile, Toru lives his dream by acquiring titles and relics from every room he explores. A lightning bolt falls from the sky, capturing the attention of the citizens. Apparently, it is because Toru is unlocking new powers. Urara and Marianne panic a little after seeing the overwhelming aura around them. Toru apologizes for having scared them. He informs them that this happened because his abilities have changed. He checks his stats, and although his level is still 300 and his race is dragon folk, he seems to have gotten new jobs including the Dragon Knight, Master Tamer, Imitator, and the Great Thief. Katie informs him that all of those jobs are superior and high ranking. There is just one mysterious job title called the Imitator that Katie doesn't seem to understand. Marianne and Urara request Toru to allow them to join their party, Manu Brigade, for as long as they are staying in the town. Although reluctant at first, Toru eventually agrees. 
As they explore deeper and deeper, the number of demons around them starts increasing. Some even attack Marianne, and Tori uses his opportunity to teach her how to fight. He teaches her how to keep her eyes open all the time and to be more confident. After that, he shows her a demonstration as well. Following Tori's suggestions, Marianne takes down her first opponent, which seems to be a giant spider-like monster. She levels up and reaches 36. After experiencing the thrill of leveling up, Urara and Marianne seem unstoppable and wish to explore the dungeon even more. Toru reminds them not to be hasty and decides that it's time to head back to the surface. However, Marianne is too excited to back down. She argues that there is still some time left, she would like to take a look at some of the unexplored areas. Realizing that Marianne won't be willing to go home anytime soon, Toru accepts her suggestion and everyone agrees to explore a little more. Surprisingly, they come to a dead end. Although Marianne and Urara are convinced of its nature, Toru suspects that something feels a little strange. He knocks on the wall and realizes that it sounds suspicious. He draws a circle on the weakest area of the wall and then breaks it. Much to their surprise, there was a mysterious room hidden behind the wall. They instantly start inspecting the objects lying around. Toru comes across a sword that is made up of mysterious metal. It doesn't have a single trace of rust, even though it was made a long time ago. He realizes that the sword is made up of incredible technology. Apparently, Katie has found something even more mysterious. There are two eggs of different shapes that seem to have been abandoned for a long time, so there is no guarantee that they're still alive. She uses her appraisal to identify that the eggs were summoned beasts, artificial creatures that were created by the ancient race. These creatures were used to assist in civilization's daily tasks and provided support during combat. These eggs have been stored for long-term survival, and the only way of awakening them is by pouring a lot of magic power into them. Toru's love for ancient stuff comes to life, and he excitedly holds the egg to awaken it. He puts the majority of his magic into the egg, but nothing happens. Kitty comments that this is because it was dormant for a long time, and originally possessed great magical powers. This makes Toru even more excited, and he starts taking the task seriously. He channels almost all of his magical power into the egg, and suddenly, the dungeon starts shaking. Urara and Marianne start panicking again from the overwhelming amount of magical power. Toru's aura causes the space to become distorted, and Kitty comments that it is as if they are all standing in water. However, Toru is only concerned about the egg for the time being. After realizing that it is finally ready to be awakened, the last remaining to finish the contract is to draw some blood. He pours the drops of blood on the egg, and suddenly cracks appear on its shell. The egg erupts while everyone's eyes are glued to it. Anticipating the emergence of some monstrous creature, Katie and Toru prepare themselves. Once the hatching process is over, the duo is surprised to see a one-eyed beast floating in front of their eyes. The only problem is that it looks nothing like a beast, but is rather fluffy and cuddly. They immediately start touching it, while Katie remarks that it is beautiful. Using her ability, she gives it a shower. Toru comments that although the creature is cute, was it really worth spending so much magical power to awaken it? Hearing Toru question its usefulness, the creature suddenly lifts Katie into the air. Toru is impressed by its ability to carry people, and since it is fluffy, it is perfect for the job. They decide that it will be useful to transport all the things they've gathered. Katie requests to give it a name, and Toru, being Toru, names it Panda. While Katie introduces it to Aurora and Marianne, Toru can't help but feel excited about awakening the other strange-looking egg. Back at the castle, they arrange all the relics they have gathered. Along with superior healing potions and medicines to strengthen one's body, they are unknown objects. Toru asks Katie to use her appraisal and finds out that one of them is a rare elixir that isn't sold anywhere. The Lord informs him that if they visit the royal capital, some rich noble merchant might buy it. He recommends them to sell it in an auction. Toru remembers that there is an auction in the royal capital meant for nobility and rich merchants. Toru sells some of the relics to the Lord and decides to save the others for the auction. His jaw drops to the floor when he stares at the pile of cash that the Lord offers him. A few more days pass by in the city. Toru and the others enjoy exploring the ruins and hunting demons. Surprisingly, Marianne's passion has allowed her to reach level 100, whereas Urara is now at 80. Apparently, both of them now have the power level of a hero. Marianne has become quite an expert with her sword. Toru comments that it's almost as if the sword is now a part of her body. He reveals that he plans to leave the city, and suddenly, all the excitement leaves Marianne's face. Apparently, Toru has received a letter from the court inviting him to the royal auction. Before bidding farewell, Marianne tells Katie that she is jealous of her because she gets to go on a trip with Toru. She wants to leave home to see the world, but being the Count's daughter comes with a price. She has the responsibility of marrying a noble sooner or later, and won't have the privilege of choosing a husband. Toru sees her pain and realizes that she feels like a bird trapped in a cage. Seeing her gloomy face, he genuinely thanks her for everything, and promises her that they will meet again. Marianne is about to burst into tears when Katie rushes to hug her. She assures her that Toru will not forget her. After becoming certain that they will come again to see her, Marianne says her goodbyes while admitting again that she wishes she could be in Katie's shoes. Meanwhile, Sane is slowly following in Toru's footsteps. He starts pulling out his hair when he realizes that yet another dungeon has been explored. 
The citizens inform him that the dungeon was around for a month and someone got here earlier and completed it before him. He starts biting his nails after realizing that this was where he was going to make his debut as a hero, but instead ended up wasting his time. Sora, worried about him, approaches him and asks him if he's alright, but despair has turned him into a completely different person. He starts to strangle her, and the other girls have to interfere to stop him from killing her. He starts imagining things and assumes that everyone around him is pitying him. People gather around and call him a madman. When they are about to call the cops, Sane realizes that mistreating three women will not be good for his reputation. However, the fact that they have started to defy him, Saint understands that the effect of brainwashing is wearing off. He activates his demon eye and puts all three of them under the spell again, and they become his puppets. One of the girls comments that the Armin's kingdom is the perfect place for their party to make its mark, so they should return to their country and start from scratch with a new route, because all of their plans depend on the assumption that he will obtain the sacred sword. Sane loses his temper again, when he realizes that she is suggesting that he should kneel before King Belseel and admit that he failed. He decides that he will now start pursuing other sacred swords. He is then informed that there is a town nearby called Anark, and it is known to have unexplored ruins. Not knowing that Toru has already made his mark on the land, Sane gets excited to attract the attention of the city. However, his happiness disappears when the Lord of Enarch informs him that the ruins have already been explored by the party known as Manu Brigade. Lord remarks that the party also took care of the general of the demon army. When Marianne enters the room, Sane's temper calms down. He becomes excited to use the demonic eye of seduction on her, but it causes his own eyes to start bleeding. His appraisal notifies him that he can't use the skill on a person that is of higher level than him. Before he could respond, Marianne puts her sword against his neck and asks him about his intention. The Lord commands him to leave the place in an instant, and boasts that the guy who explored the ruins had purity of heart that he lacks. After getting thrown out, Sane starts breaking things while claiming to be a hero. Eventually, he decides that he will go back to Armand for the sacred sword. He commands the girls to follow him, and with a furious determination, he wants to become the man he used to be, the man who had everything under his control. After leaving Einark, Katie and Turo keep on polishing and intensifying their skills and talents. They have now unlocked various other titles and treasures. Even taking care of a giant dragon has become a piece of cake for them. Apparently, they awaken the other egg and obtained a combat beast. Toru has named him Ryusuke, and it looks a lot different than Panda. It seems like Katie can understand the language of the beast as she effortlessly communicates with them. As the duo had expected, the beasts do not get along well with each other. Panda is a transporter, whereas Ryosuke is a fighter. However, they both are useful in their own way. When Katie commands that Ryosuke can fly higher than Panda, the latter doesn't like it, so he challenges his rival to a competition. Panda quickly comes back to the ground after realizing that he can only fly up to 10 meters. Meanwhile, Ryosuke's flying ability looks limitless. When they are about to start preparing food, Toru summons Ryosuke back into a symbol on his hand. Katie insists that she wants to cook the way Urara taught. However, soon, Toru's appetite disappears when he notices the burnt-up fish and frog that are about to be used as ingredients. The dish turns out to be purple in color, and Toru suddenly feels like puking. Contrary to his expectation, the meal turns out to be delicious. Toru compliments Katie's talent for cooking, and she lovingly starts cuddling him. However, Toru's trauma of getting abandoned still hasn't left him. The girl who left him for Sane starts taunting him in his thoughts for replacing her with a slave. He shrugs off his fear and makes a promise to himself to never treat Katie like an object. The smell of the food Katie has cooked has attracted several more wyverns as they seem to be bigger than the ones they slayed earlier. However, Ryosuke alone was able to take down all five of them. Toru isn't sure why Ryosuke is so strong because it isn't normal for summoned beasts to have such capabilities. Katie comments that it must be because of Toru's blood. The duo finally arrives at the capital, Armand, and is amazed at its beauty. Armand is known to be a trading hub with many famous adventurers around. Before he can explore the city, Toru knows that he must first deliver the letter Count of Einark had assigned him. The recipient of the letter is someone named Jonathan Rockbell, who has a shipping business. The duo is on their way, when suddenly one of the animals gets spooked by something and loses control. The adventurers try to control it, but fail. That's when Toru decides to help them and easily tames it. The person they helped turns out to be the vice president, who takes him to Jonathan Rockbell. After reading the Count's letter, Jonathan tells him that the Count has requested a great reward for Toru, so he should come back tomorrow dressed in a presentable manner. However, Toru thinks that this gesture can only mean trouble is on its way. Clothed in a formal tuxedo, our protagonist feels cramped in the stiff garments. Adjusting his collar, he shares his discomfort with Katie, who is also looking stunning in a shimmering gown. She assures him that his look is dashing for the occasion. Jonathan Rockbell arrives at their residence, seated in a wagon, and invites them to get in. Here, he reveals that Marquis Ryan's request was that he met with a renowned individual and who would provide great benefits to our protagonist. Toru is a bit hesitant when Jonathan requests him not to share details of the meeting with anyone, since his particular personality does not meet with ordinary citizens, which is why it shall be a private meeting. Reaching the end of their journey, Toru and Katie are amazed to find an enormous castle as their destination. 
Climbing a flight of stairs, the group reach a room which is guarded by a servant, who requests them to wait while he announces their arrival. The room is as royal as the rest of the premises, with a library of books and even an antelope head hung up on the wall. A tall bearded man enters who is accompanied by two soldiers. He is introduced as King Armand. Toru is once again reminded to keep his meeting private and not to reveal any details to the public. The king does not beat around the bush, and gets straight to the point. He reveals that the Imperial capital is in danger, and he requires the help of the two adventurers to deal with the threat. When Toru asks him to specify, he's taken aback when the king explains that he wishes for Toru to slay the Death Queen Ant. King Armand discloses that a huge number of their troops had been lost while trying to deal with these deadly creatures. Such is their strength that they are able to devour entire villages in a matter of days, and it is only a matter of time before they set their sights on the Imperial capital. Despite how dangerous the mission is, Toru immediately accepts. The royal figure offers him an area of territory as well as the title of hero if he is successful, which the adventurer refuses. He only demands money, which is then set as his reward for the triumph. Humu, the core commander, is selected to lead the duo towards the ant's nest. King Armand is still confused as to why Toru does not wish for the title of hero, to which our protagonist replies that he is not in favor of standing out. Humu guides them to an abandoned forest where the corpses of soldiers decorate the floor. It is obvious that the city has suffered a huge number of casualties while dealing with this threat, and Toru is probably their last resort. As the group nears the nest, Katie nonsensically asks if the ants really are that dangerous. This is enough to shock the two male warriors, and Toru wonders to himself the type of confined life the girl had been living before he purchased her. The vicious ants were known by almost everyone. Deep in conversation, Toru does not notice that they have wandered into the enemy's territory until it's too late, and the ants have surrounded them. Humu begins to panic when he analyzes the huge member of onrushing creatures, and he cannot help but doubt that the two young adventurers would be able to deal with such a dangerous threat. However, his doubts are misplaced, as it only takes a single swipe of Toru's magical sword to slay an army of them, and Katie's air press spell knocks the remaining ones out. Humu is lost for words, and he is even more shocked when the young girl manages to freeze the entire area so that they are able to identify the nest. The core commander feels useless, and an embarrassed voice comments that his job is done and that the two adventurers can take it from here. The narrow hole seems to be quite risky to go through, and since Toru acquires the head of the queen ant, he needs to defeat her directly. He suddenly remembers the dungeon of Luntada that had been added to his inventory. Selecting the option allows the adventurer to turn the ant's nest into a similar dungeon. This would not only make it easier for him to wander the area, but since he is the owner of the dungeon, he could roam every floor freely. The duo transfers themselves into the nest where the queen ant is hysterical over who messed with her territory. She unleashes her hench ants upon the adventurers, but Katie reduces them to bits and pieces with a single attack. This does not discourage the queen as she suddenly begins to feed on the corpses of the ants and grows in strength. The high level beast is able to use magic and attacks Toru with an ice snap. Our protagonist is not expecting it and is engulfed in the iceberg. Thinking that he has been killed, the queen moves on to Katie with a menacing glare. However, it will take much more than just a simple spell to defeat our overpowered protagonist. Toru shatters the iceberg and faces the Queen Ant. By now, her rage has reached immeasurable levels, as she is unable to understand how this simple warrior is able to counter her high-level attacks. She unleashes an earthquake that narrowly misses Toru, and he realizes that engaging in close combat would be close to impossible if she continues using such strikes. The Queen then releases formic acid from her mouth to push the warrior even further back. The acid is highly toxic, and can burn normal humans to a crisp. He attempts to stay airborne, but the creature is able to spit the acid all the way up as well. Although the toxic liquid does not injure him, he does not wish to burn his clothes. Swinging his sword over his head, he displaces the acid and faces his enemy with a determined glare. Even though she is at a level 100, the creature realizes that she is inferior in comparison to the strength of this warrior. So, as a last resort, she unleashes all her power upon Toru. This is the moment he had been waiting for as he dodges the onslaught and immediately rushes to her head and slices it clean off. With a triumphant grin, he sheaths his sword and announces that another quest has been completed. Scanning the other floors, he finds out that the monsters of the dungeons have taken it upon themselves to feast on the rest of the death ants, and in no time at all, their existence is completely wiped. However, despite having her head cut off, the queen ant is still able to talk and warns the adventurers of the consequences of their actions. The fight has exhausted our protagonist, and he did not wish to listen to her rambling, so then Katie stores the head away. Toru returns back to the castle, where he presents the battle trophy to Jonathan Rockbell. He appreciates the warrior's fine work, and is grateful that due to his bravery, the capital would now remain free of danger. Our protagonist reveals that there were not as many ants as the mission had stated, to which the Count assures him that this was because of the large number of soldiers who had lost their lives trying to fight them. At this moment, a few soldiers walk in and pay their respects to Toru for his valor and skill. The humble adventurer is bashful while listening to all this praise. The acknowledgement does not stop here, as Toru and Katie are summoned to the king's court, where a huge audience awaits them. Wearing their best formal clothes, they stand before King Armand as he appreciates them for ending the threat of the killer ants once and for all. 
Presenting them with a chest of 300 million, he announces that this is a token of their admiration. Moreover, he also reveals that since the Manyu Brigade is led by him, the entire party would be given the hero status. This is unheard of, as usually only an individual is given that honor. Toru is taken aback, but since the king demands a high amount of respect, he decides to accept. With a deafening roar, King Armin's declares the Manyu Brigade as the heroes of the country. As things begin to settle down, Toru decides to spend some quality time with Katie. The two are gifted a homely abode within the city to stay in during their wait. Jonathan Rockbell shows the house off to them and then reveals that it was Rowan's request for the warrior to be given the hero's title. When the count has gone, Katie makes a cup of coffee for her master. The two then decide to wander the city as it has been a long time since they have enjoyed a day out. Toru is the first to leave while Katie cleans up. When he reaches the area where they had planned to meet, he is pissed to see two guys harassing her. He comes to her rescue and beats them up when they try to jump him. Asking her why she had not defended herself, Katie reveals that she was about to kill them before he had shown up. Talk about being crazy with a beautiful face. The two visit numerous shops and stalls, but the highlight of their day is their visit to the rafting park. Sitting close together, the two enjoy the bumps and scares of the ride as it travels down a choppy stream. They are startled when the boat suddenly seems to be going down a waterfall, but it is part of the entertainment and they end the ride soaked. The adrenaline rush is enough to make the two of them erupt in laughter, even though Katie's brand new clothes are now all wet. Returning back home, Toru is filled with happiness and satisfaction on the day he spent with Katie. Even though she is technically still his slave, he treats her like his companion, and after the longest time, he does not feel so alone in the world anymore. He tells her that every day they spend together is enjoyable for him. She smiles back and assures him that she feels the same. In other news, Sane has begun to suffer the consequences of his actions. His cocky attitude results in even his grown-up beginning to distance themselves from him. However, things have begun to look up for him as he has finally managed to discover a dungeon that is unexplored. It is near the capital, and its high danger level makes it almost certain that he would receive fame if he is able to go through it successfully. The rare loot that they would uncover is another jackpot, but the narcissist that Sane is, he only wishes for personal glory. Embarking on the journey, the group have to go through a strange forest. Even the area outside the dungeon is packed with other adventurers. Analyzing their levels, Saint is filled with glee that they are all low-level amateurs and would only make his mission all the more easy. With a determined look on their faces, the team led by Sane enter the dungeon. They are sure that they would clear out the area in only a matter of time and fame would be handed to them on a silver platter. However, they are in for a harsh reality check when a bunch of high-level orcs suddenly surround them. Having only dealt with minor orcs previously, Sane and the rest of his warriors are speechless. Sora is unable to handle the stress and faints. However, the selfish leader has no time for his comrades and charges forward at the creatures. A single blow by the orc is enough to send Sane flying into the dungeon wall. Even the warrior's magic is no match for these high-level beasts. Saint attempts to electrocute them, but to no avail, and the orcs laugh at his face. Out of magic, Lisa tries to set up an earth wall between the group and the orcs, but they easily break through it. His cowardice finally evident, Sane is the first to retreat without even a backward glance at his teammates. Out of breath, they finally manage to escape to the outside of the dungeon where Sane is having a meltdown. Smacking Lisa across the face, he blames the weakness of his group for their failure. Noticing the watching onlookers, Sane is forced to compose himself or it would create an even worse impression. He cannot help but remember how good-natured everyone was when Toru was a part of the group. No matter how bad the situation got, his pleasant temper would keep everyone smiling. The hero pulls himself out of his thoughts to listen to a group of adventurers passing by them. They are discussing how they were successful in clearing the first floor and discovering lots of treasure, and once they got more experience, they would sweep the second floor as well. Lisa has the brilliant idea of taking the help of the adventurers as some tips might aid them in their mission. However, Sane's pride refuses to let him ask a lower level warrior for help, and he instead schemes to follow the group. Unsheathing his sword, his plan is to slay these lower level individuals and steal their loot. Things go from bad to worse for the ill-fated hero, as it turns out that the male adventurers are busy answering the call of nature, and surprised by Sane's appearance, they accidentally release their waste upon him. Back at the camp, the female warriors cover their nose to mask the stench coming from the area. Searching for the source, they come across Sane trudging across the field. They all rush away from him and demand that he cleans himself up in the sea first. Meanwhile, in a polar opposite situation, Toru is enjoying a life of luxury. Attending a high-end event for the rich, he is wearing his preferred tuxedo while Katie is seated next to him looking ravishing as usual. He is enjoying a glass of expensive champagne, while Katie reveals that this is the home of the second most important marquee of the capital. As a result, everything is first class. Their conversation is interrupted by Kiyui, who breaks the seal on Toru's wrist and pops out to inspect the surroundings. Katie further asks about how they had managed to book seats at such an important auction event. Going back a few days, Toru had been having a conversation with Count Rowan. Our protagonist has a bit of lighthearted banter with the official, saying that he has finally accepted the hero title that the Count had been wishing him to have. The Count replies that it is the least he could do, considering how the warrior had saved his daughter's life. On the topic of the Count's daughter, Toru asks him about her whereabouts, to which he reveals that she is busy in training to be a wife. 
Roran also gives a snide comment that even a common man with the title of hero is eligible to marry a noblewoman. However, Toru is unable to comprehend what the official means and the moment passes. Leaving the house, Count Irwain gives an invitation to our protagonist to attend a high-profile auction event where he might discover some precious item that would catch his fancy. That would explain why Toru and Katie are seated in this huge manor, surrounded by some of the city's richest individuals. As the presenter enters the stage and begins to announce the objects on auction, Toru takes an interest. Ridiculously high prices are charged for magical objects, ranging from a huge diamond to a slutty elf slave. However, the item that catches our protagonist's attention is an ancient scroll left behind by species of the past. None of the other billionaires understand the value of such a relic, which is why Toru is the only bidder and wins the object at the cost of a measly one million. Time goes on as bid after bid takes place. Soon enough, a caged fairy is brought to the stage. Suddenly, Toru begins to hear whispered voices near his ear. The voice asks him for help, and our protagonist realizes that it is the fairy who is pleading for him to come to her rescue. Toru enters into a bidding war with the two rich men, who continue to say even higher numbers. However, due to our protagonist's success in missions, he is not short on finance and is able to rival the offers made by the other two. Eventually, one of them gives up, but the other is hellbent on purchasing the dainty magical creature. His intentions for the female fairy seem to be anything but innocent, which makes Toru even more determined to save the creature from this pervert. Our protagonist eventually wins the bid with an offer of one billion. As the auction comes to an end, Toru announces that he has one final object up for sale. Going up to the stage, he presents an elixir, a magical potion that is able to heal even the most fatal of wounds. The auctioneer keeps it up for bid, and it is sold for an enormous amount. In the back room, the auctioneer pays Toru his sale proceeds and hands over the fairy that he won. Back at home, the warrior attempts to communicate with the fairy, but her moody attitude has him pulling out his hair. She is hesitant in trusting a human, since her past experiences have proven they are cunning creatures. However, as soon as he offers her a cookie, she immediately sits up and her mood drastically changes. He then reveals that he had heard her asking for help, which is why he had come to her rescue. The fairy suddenly becomes speechless and falls to the ground in apology. Calling Toru her lord, she announces that our protagonist is of a dragon man descent. These were magnificent beings with advancements far beyond their time and had left a large amount of relics. The fairy then explains that her name is Faru, and her entire family's main aim is to please the dragon men. Humble as always, Toru is hesitant about being called words like master, but she is insistent that if she does not become his slave, her family will disown her. The fairy then assures him that she is a skilled warrior and would support him no matter what. The next morning, Toru wakes up to find Faru sleeping next to him on the pillow. Carrying her snoozing body downstairs, he joins Katie for breakfast and they discuss their next plan of action. Since they would be staying in the capital for a few days, Toru decides to explore other hidden areas to see if they could uncover more rare objects. This is when Faru awakens and invites the two of them to her fairy village. She explains that the area would be beautiful at this time of the year, and there are many ruins there that they would enjoy exploring. However, she also reveals that fairy folk do not take kindly to humans, so they shall have to be on their guard. Once their destination has been decided, they now have to find some way of occupying themselves for the week they remain in the capital. They visit the guild to see if there were some quests available for them to accept. However, a huge commotion is created when the citizens there recognize them as the Manu Brigade. They all rush towards them for autographs and a chance to meet the renowned group. Even the guild leader is ecstatic about being face to face with such legends and announces that they have been promoted to an S rank group on account of their hero status. An introvert, Tor does not enjoy such attention and requests Katie to use a blinding light as distraction. Using this opportunity, they vanish into thin air. Once outside, Toru concludes that maybe it would be easier to just laze around back at home. The other two agree, and they return back to their humble abode. Toru is ready to use some water magic, while Katie watches the show with amazement. Of course, he uses the other elements like earth and wind to cause a huge dust storm, which also doesn't seem to help him out. Katie is worried about the need to use wind magic in this situation, while Toru can't seem to be satisfied about the attempts he is making. He is about to go try again, but thankfully, Katie has had just enough of him using the magic. Plus, it pains her to say as a slave, but she blurts out that her master's magic is clearly too dangerous. She knows that he is trying to regulate the storm with a spell, but the way of his release is quite unstable. Hearing this, Toru goes into the defensive mode and is proud that he can use his magic continuously, and the power is also perfect. Maybe he should try to use it more effectively for something. At this point, he remembers that he always wanted a fire sword when he was a child. Thinking about fire makes his magic go berserk, and a flare bursts out from his hand, which scares Katie. She is pretty sure that her master is trying to kill her. Toru says sorry to her, when a notification tells him that the level 3 dungeon is now level 5, which is a bit confusing to him. Katie explains that she has heard about a dungeon before, and it is said that a dungeon of great difficulty has appeared in the capital. Apparently, the items that appear in this dungeon are of rare value. Therefore, it has become very popular among the adventurers. Hearing this, Toru screams out, asking if this is the same dungeon where they defeated the Death Ants. Katie believes that this is the case, while Toru freaks out about the dungeon leveling up. Although, it might probably be because there are so many dead adventurers everywhere. Toru obviously freaks out even more, and his screams remind his slave of a Demon King. 
On the other hand, it's pretty cool for Toru as an adventurer to have a dungeon near where they live, and since he's the owner, he believes that they should check it out. It looks like they can even transport there, therefore it takes them a second to arrive at a pretty strange place. It seems like they are one floor below the actual center stone, and Toru gets the idea that they can maybe use it as a storage space, which is possibly the best idea he can get. Katie is also ready to take advantage of this space and takes out her collection of Toru's clothing to spread on the floor. Toru finds it weird that she is stealing her clothes, but decides to pretend like he hasn't seen it. It sounds like a better idea for him to build a wall for Katie's space. This is when Panda tries to fight with Frau over the space, and he's getting quite territorial while he tries to squish Katie under his giant eyeball. It really amuses Toru that Panda wins over Frau, and laughs out loud as he watches the two run away from him at top speed. He really is entertained with these two. The next morning, Toru feels like he is in paradise with a nice cup of coffee, when Katie reminds him that they need to discuss the day's plans, but it turns out that she has a lot of complaints about her chores. Apparently, she's thinking about doing Fro's laundry, but doesn't even have any clothes other than the ones she's wearing. Maybe they should take her shopping. Katie likes the idea of going into town and buying some new things, and Toru also agrees to their request as he has also been running out of clothes. Katie has obviously still not admitted to her stealing clothes, though. Soon enough, they get to town and wonder if they will find anything in Frau's tiny size. The perfect idea is to go to a doll store and hope for the best. Therefore, they enter the store and Frau starts trying on some clothes. Looking at all the dolls, Toru is reminded of Nei and Sora, who had dolls when they were kids. Lisa also had one of the expensive dolls that she threw away, much like she threw Toru away. Old wounds don't go away so easily, for sure. He comes out of his deep thoughts when the owner shows up and shows them the fairy costume that his late wife made. He is ready to give them up for free, just for his wife's sake, and Toru and his group happily take it for the little Frau. Later, Toru inspects the dolls more closely, while Frau does a whole fashion show in front of them as she needs to show off all the new outfits. They soon leave the shop after buying everything they like, and say bye to the old shopkeeper who finds huge stacks of cash on his counter. He can't believe that Toru just made him rich, but obviously he loves a surprise. It's a brand new morning when Katie barges into Toru's room and asks him to take off his shirt so she can do the laundry. Of course, Toru already knows the purpose behind her asking for his shirt, therefore he tries to get her to wash the sheets first, which are stained with food. Katie is also too smart for him as she tells him that his shirt is just as stained as the sheet. Her eagerness to wash the shirt is apparent, which is why Toru admits his defeat, and takes off his shirt so she can wash it. Toru goes to get breakfast next and notices that the bread and coffee are different this morning. His musings make Katie reveal that she is trying out the new bakery that the neighbor's wife has suggested, and she looks glad about making their home in the capital. It really does give a domestic vibe, doesn't it? Toru is scared about not wanting to leave after spending a week in the capital, but he can't think of any more places to go. Katie doesn't have any place in mind to visit either, but she is eager to go shopping with Toru. It looks like their ration is running out since Frau eats the equivalent of five people. Therefore, Toru has to agree to go out for some grocery shopping in order to get some more food supplies. This is when Panda and Frau break one of the windows of the house, which anchors Toru, but he can't do something about it as they run away as soon as he looks out. He really needs to get used to these two doing all these playful things. Later in town, Toru overhears a conversation about the sandworms that have recently appeared in the field in various parts of Armand. What really catches Toru's attention is when he hears that there have been tornadoes, heavy rains, and earthquakes in the area, which created an imbalance in their natural habitat and forced them to rise to the surface. He knows that it's all because of his magic, but the guild hasn't stopped putting in requests to hunt worms. Meanwhile, Toru tries to pretend like he never even heard the conversation and goes on his way with his friends. Katie begins her vegetable shopping and gets distracted by the fresh and tasty tomatoes, and soon hears that Toru wants to restock his canned food. This clearly means that they need to resume their adventure, which makes Katie a bit sad as she really isn't ready to say goodbye to the routine she has established in the capital. Toru also feels like it's just better to stay at this place, but there's a part of him that just can't forget what happened to him. This is a journey to heal his broken heart and move on, and he certainly cannot remain motionless. Soon, they buy everything they need and start leaving when Toru spots a woman who seems to have been separated from her five-year-old daughter, Kumin. The ever-helpful Toru also begins to look for little Kumin around the capital square, and asks Katie to follow her with her sense of smell. Katie takes Kumin's handkerchief from her mother for reference, and finds that Kumin is still near the market. Immediately, they all start running towards the direction where Katie is leading them, and finally find Kumin sitting alone in an alley. The mother-daughter reunite, and it's all wholesome, until the sandworms burst out from under the ground. Toru knows that he needs to evacuate Kumin and her mother first, therefore he asks Katie to distract the worm. After he leads them into safety, he is determined to deal with the sandworm as he knows that he should have used his magic more responsibly. Of course, this is no time for regrets as it's time to hunt them all down. On the other hand, Katie is doing a wonderful job distracting the sandworm when Toru comes back and notices that the sandworm has a regeneration capacity, which is crazy. He looks over at Katie, whose clothes have been melted off by the sandworm's acid, which is naturally making her quite shy. After covering up, she tells him that her magic is useless this day. Therefore, Toru will need to use his magic, which only scares him. 
he knows that if he makes one mistake, the whole city can be destroyed. He channels all the elements once again, including wind, earth, water, and fire, to deal with the sandworm, and finally manages to defeat the giant worm all alone, which makes the entire city applaud him for his heroic act. Later, Toru and his friends leave the capital and begin their adventure to go to the fairy village, all excited to face the hurdles on the way. On the way to the fairy village, Toru and his gang have made a pit stop at the border town of Grigget, where they wake up all cozy in their bed. Toru finds out that Frau has been looking for her, which makes him think that she might want him to do something as she is quite excited to go to the fairy village. This is when Katie notices that her master's armor is about to break, which makes her suggest that he should buy a new one. Luckily, she knows the perfect place where he can find good armor. She soon takes him to the temple of the sacred weapon, which looks as awesome as it sounds, and Toru can't suppress his grin. Apparently, the sacred weapon is a sword, but it's not limited to just one form if the person has the image of what they want in mind before they draw the sword. The sacred weapon's performance surely stands out from the rest as it is nearly indestructible and can provide a significant status increase and a temporary level boost. Toru is a bit skeptical since he already has a sacred weapon and it might nearly be impossible to get a second one. Of course, he gets some self-confidence when he realizes that Katie really believes in him and his skills. Suddenly, they notice some footprints on the ground which makes them curious. It looks like three or four people have already been there and possibly taken the sacred weapon too. They still move ahead to take a look and are relieved to find the sacred weapon still there. As Toru walks towards it, a million thoughts go through his mind, and he starts doubting himself again. At this point, it's revealed that a few days ago back in the capital, Sane goes to a bar and asks for some good-paying jobs. He thinks that he is a famous hero who doesn't require him to give any introductions, but soon loses his mind when he doesn't get the importance that he wants from everyone. Everyone tells him to make a name for himself if he wants preferential treatment, just like Toru's party has done. Hearing this, Sane completely goes into his rage mode and punches one of the bystanders, which leads to a full-fledged fight breaking out in the bar. The citizens of the capital also get angry with his behavior and decide to throw him out for being a fake hero who hurts innocent people. Thankfully, Sane's party members calm him down, which gives him a chance to inquire more about Toru's party. The bartender tells him that the Manu Brigade, Toru's party, has killed some of the deadliest beasts in the country, like the Queen of the Death Ants, which no one had been able to defeat for so long. After hearing about this party's heroic tales, Sane screams and seems pretty sure that he would have overshadowed this low-ranked party if he were in the capital. He inquires about them even more and finds out that the Manu Brigade has gone to Grigget. He smiles in quite an evil way after hearing this piece of information and tells his team to immediately prepare for the trip. Sane and his party follow the Manu Brigade to Grigget and even find out that the place where they are staying. These guys can get some solid stalker credentials. Sane decides to get to the Sacred Sword himself first, and then tear Toru to pieces. Of course, he doesn't know that his old friend Toru is the leader of the Manu Brigade. He goes to the Sacred Weapon Temple with his team, and is ready to be the proud owner of a Sacred Sword after enduring so many difficulties. It's his time to shine, finally. Funnily, he can't seem to pick up the sword at all, as it seems stuck to the ground. He uses his entire strength to pick it up, but it looks like the sword has a mind of its own, which angers Sane to another level. The day after Sane and his party fail to get the sword, Toru has acquired it, which turns into a new armor for him. The armor is unbelievable, and moves like a feather, which will be quite helpful for him during battles. Soon, they are back on the road as the journey to the fairy village commences. They camp at night when Toru realizes that he needs to learn more about Katie's past when he hears her talking in her sleep. Maybe he should start paying more attention to this cute little slave. Frau is shining like a true hero as she handles the fight with a bunch of beasts, while Toru and Katie look totally amazed at her. Frau is glad to be showing off her skills as she is excited for Toru to see her differently now. Hearing this, Toru tells her that he has never had a negative opinion about her, which makes her call him out for lying as she strongly believes that Toru never thought she was capable of a proper fight. Poor girl clearly needs an ego boost. Toru agrees that he has indeed undervalued Frau, while the fairy checks that her level has risen to 35, which is quite impossible. This makes Toru believe that his teammate's experience is multiplying because of his skill, which might or might not be cheating. The jury is still out on that one. Of course, Frau doesn't mind anything as long as she gets to level up as much as she can. Therefore, she flies off to fight some more. Watching her go, Toru and Katie get a bit scared since they don't have anyone to lead the way with Frau gone. She is clearly the only person who knows the way to the fairy village, right? They might just have to wait for her to come back from her killing spree. Therefore, they sit down to rest while Katie decides to make some coffee. These people are caffeine addicted for sure, folks. This is when a few fairies attack Katie and Toru, who just wanted to mind their own business. The leader of the fairies realizes that Toru is not an ordinary human being. Therefore, he decides to fight with him alone. However, Toru doesn't want to fight back as he doesn't want to hurt any of Frau's friends. He really wishes that Frau hadn't run away at this point. Thankfully, none of the fairies' attacks hit Toru or Frau. 
therefore, the fairy's leader flies up, ready to use some wide area magic on them. Toru is getting even more desperate for Frau to come back and handle the situation. Therefore, he screams orders at her to be back at the top of his lungs. Suddenly, they all sense something coming at them at top speed, which makes Toru breathe a sigh of relief as he knows that it must be Frau who is on her way back. When she finally arrives back, she doesn't look pleased with her fairy friends for attacking her master. This is when it's revealed that the leader of the fairy army is Frau's father, who begins to respectfully lead them all towards the fairy village. Soon, they arrive at their destination, which is so beautiful that none of them can help but smiling and staring at everything around them. They are soon taken to a small hut, which looks too big for the fairies, but big enough to fit the humans. They are introduced to Frau's grandfather, who is also the chief of the village, and Toru is extremely horrified to witness the old man beating up his son for hurting Toru. Apparently, Toru is from the Great Race, which makes Frau's intentions clear to him behind bringing him closer to the village. Their grandfather begins to narrate that their village is in a crucial situation, and since their people could do nothing about it, they had to look outside for help. It seems like only the Great Race can help them out, which is why Frau went out to look for him, which makes us wonder, why her? It turns out that Frau has the ability to recite prayers to the Great Race, which makes her perfect for the job. It's another thing that she doesn't look like a priestess at all. Frau also reveals that it was quite hard to find Toru as she searched for over a year, until some humans captured and sold her. It turned out to be lucky though, as she discovered Toru, which makes him believe in fate as well. However, he really needs to know more about the problem that this village is facing before making any decisions. Frau and her grandfather bring him outside to show him the golem, which is trying to destroy their people after waking up one day out of nowhere. Of course, they tried to attack him, but couldn't even leave a single scratch on the golem's being. Currently, they are trying to bind him up using their magic, but he is not sure about how much longer they can hold out. Toru starts thinking real hard about this dilemma, and begins to move closer and take a better look at the golem while the fairies try to stop him. He obviously gets too close to the golem and finds that it doesn't seem to have the authority to obey, which gives them no choice but to destroy it. Suddenly, the golem gets untied and Toru tells Katie to stay behind him while he handles the situation. Toru and the golem have an intense battle where the golem overpowers him at various points, but he manages to outsmart the weird monster without even getting hurt. After dodging the golem's attacks for a while, he acknowledges that it is indeed quite strong, but he is also a hero who has a few tricks up his sleeve. He jumps over the golem and lands a killing blow to it, which makes all the fairies and Katie jump up and down with excitement. The great race indeed has enormous power, and to celebrate his win, Frau's grandfather is surely going to get a fantastic feast prepared. The party led by Sane in search of the Holy Sword finally arrives at the North Star. Everyone is drenched in their sweat as it seems to be super hot. They complain that if only Sane had acquired the Holy Sword from the last temple, then they wouldn't have had to come this far. Everything they are saying is only making Sane lose his temper more and more. While gritting his teeth, he refers to them as noisy women. His reputation as his own country is hanging by a thread and he knows it. However, he blames it on the trio of women that he's hypnotized with his eye of demonic seduction. Sane is so frustrated that it looks like his eyes will bulge out. He curses his fate and makes a promise to himself to get the Holy Sword this time, because otherwise there will be no tomorrow for him. He might be able to endure such tough terrain and hot weather, but the girls have had enough. They see a city nearby, so they request Sane to let them stop by and grab something to eat. Sane looks at them furiously after mentioning that they are almost at the temple, so there is no point in stopping now. However, he himself knows that he is at his limit and might even pass out soon. He agrees to eat in the city. The ladies rejoice while walking towards the city, and Sane plans to deal with them later on, because to him, they have become a nuisance. They arrive at the city that is filled with humans and demi-humans. Despite the scorching weather, people look delightful and seem to be having fun. Sane and the trio visit a nearby restaurant, and all of their appetite vanishes when they see the worms and insects that they are served. They question how they are even supposed to eat food that doesn't look appetizing at all. Sane comments that people in the city must be insane for eating this stuff, but when he looks to his right and left, he's surprised to see his own woman enjoying eating the bugs. She remarks that despite its ugly looks, the dishes are actually delicious. Sane's stomach is growling, but he refuses to believe that insects could be tasty. He is planning on getting rid of the woman that ate it because she now must be infected. He, along with the other two women, settle on eating the salad and bread to satisfy their hunger. However, after realizing that he doesn't want to waste the food he ordered and that he doesn't know when he'll get to eat again, Sane starts maniacally devouring the insects while hilariously claiming to be the hero who isn't afraid of bugs. After that, they continue their journey towards the temple. The sun is at its peak, and there doesn't seem to be any shadow nearby. After what felt like infinity, they finally arrived at the temple. The girls are doing fine, but Sane looks like he is two minutes away from passing out. They ask Sane if he's alright, and it seems like his stomach is hurting a lot. He complains that if everyone ate the same meals, why is it that he's the only one experiencing the after effects? While tightly grabbing his belly and thinking about how unfair the situation is, Sane angrily stares at the girl who ate twice as much as insects. He calms himself down after reminding himself about the Holy Sword. That's the only determination he has. They eventually find the gate, but Sane struggles in opening it. He trembles, and the girls ask why his legs are shaking so much. Apparently, he's been trying his best to hold in the gas caused by his upset stomach. 
After a lot of struggle, he eventually succeeds in opening the gate. The girls cheer him up, after seeing that the Holy Sword is right in front of him. The only problem for Saint is that the pedestal is too far, and he seems to be at his limits. He admits that he can't hold it any longer. Every step feels like infinity for him while the girls shout at him to hurry up. He reaches the sword, but struggles in pulling it out. He is afraid that if he applies too much pressure, something might just come out of him. One of the girls jumps in to help him. She grabs the sword with him, and together they pull it out. Everyone celebrates, and finally, Saint feels relieved. Meanwhile, at the village of the fairies, Toru and Kitty are enjoying themselves to the fullest. When Saint tasted insects, Toru was busy tasting delicious fairy honey liquor. Everyone dances around while countless delicious meals arrive for the duo. Papao asks Toru how his daughter is doing as their companion, and Toru responds that since he just joined their forces, it is hard to tell how her performance is, but nonetheless, he expects great things from her. When Toru mentions that he doesn't like the idea of Papao's daughter being his slave, the latter reminds him that fairies are the servants of the great race, and their sole duty is serving them. Other fairies gather around Toru as well. After seeing such a happy atmosphere, Toru suddenly starts feeling nostalgic. He remembers how it felt to be with his mother and father. He excuses himself to go to the bathroom, but Katie knows that something is going on with him. Meanwhile, Toru leaves to sit alone at a secluded place at the top. Soon, he's joined by Katie, who asks him how he's feeling, because it looked like he was looking for excuses to get away from the party. Toru compliments her for having sharp senses. Toru mentions that when he saw Frau's family, it reminded him of his. Katie asks him about his parents' death, and Toru narrates his gruesome backstory. Apparently, he was 15 years old when it happened. He came home to their dead bodies. Back then, they were attacked by one of the richest families around, and that's why everyone assumed that his parents were attacked by the robbers. He hasn't met any of his other family members and has been alone ever since. However, Lisa was there to support him at his lowest. Thanks to her, Toru decided to keep on living, and this is why having her beside him meant a lot to him. Katie interrupts the story to ask him if the woman he's talking about is the one who betrayed him. Toru smiles and tells her that her name is Lisa. He admits that he was shocked when they both separated, but he never thought he wouldn't be enough for her. Before Toru could say anything and have a mental breakdown, Katie hugs him tightly to comfort him. The trio continue their journey through the forest and arrive at another ruin. Toru asks Frau if this was the place where the golem originally slept, and she confirms it. He asks Katie to search around for ancient objects using her appraisal skills. He thinks about what responsibility he should give to Frau, and eventually asks her to use this opportunity to level up. After she flies away, Toru starts inspecting the objects himself. Not much later, Katie calls him after locating something suspicious. Toru sees the statue is in a weird position. He nudges it a little, and it falls over, revealing a secret passageway. Surprised and excited, Toru decides to investigate the area. After walking down a lot of stairs, the duo spot a ball of light flying in the air. They follow it and eventually come across symbols on the ground. 